Thank you. Take it away. Great thank, great, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And thank you, Anne, who is joining us for as our third speaker, I think, on our Planetary Health Speaker Series. So Anne is going to be giving us a presentation called Nature As or Is Medicine for All. So I'll give you a quick um, bio rundown of Anne. So Anne Vertebeck um, is an integrated emergency physician at Northwestern University and was a graduate of the OSHA Collaborative Faculty Fellowship in 2021. She turned into an integrated medicine, she turned to integrated medicine after observing the evolution of the epidemic of chronic lifestyle diseases, including diabetes, obesity, and anxiety. As an emergency physician, Dr. Vertovec has limited time with patients to discuss preventative care, but she emphasizes nutrition, exercise, nature, and relaxation techniques. She educates her colleagues and medical students and residents and fellows on these topics to help promote wellness for all and to mitigate career burnout. Being a lifelong gardener, hiker, nature lover, and environmentalist, Dr. Verta Beck recently switched her career focus to planetary health. She lectures on topics related to planetary health, including sustainable eating, native trees, and strengthening the focus of environment and health in medicine. In addition, she has started the Hickory podcast, which interviews world changes focusing on hope, health, and healing for ourselves and the earth. So thank you very much, Anne, for joining us today. And um, please, um, I'm handing it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so um, my topic is nature as medicine for all, but my uh, naturopathic colleague said nature is medicine for all. So I have added that uh, into the... Um, title. So uh, briefly, humans are increasingly disconnected from nature. Um, we, in the United States, four-fifths of us live in urban areas and over half globally. And by 2050, close to 70% of the world will be living in urban areas. Um, in the United States, about 93% of our time is spent indoors. And screen time and virtual reality are on the rise. Um, a not so recent statistic was about eight hours for kids eight to 18 years of age uh, are spent on screens daily. And in fact, in 2006, Richard Love had a publication where he coined the term nature deficit disorder, emphasizing the lack of nature in our children. And it's really like about three generations now where we really are um, disconnected from nature. So my objectives are to define nature, talk about research and how to prescribe it, access to nature and end with human health and planetary health. So what is nature? The English Oxford Dictionary defines it, you know, as a physical world, as opposed to humans or human creations. But unfortunately, today, the human hand, human hand. Underlies, I'm sorry, underlies um, all of our world's ecosystems. So we can't exclude man anymore from the definition, especially for research purposes. David Victorson, Christine Liberto, and uh, Karen Koffler have come up with uh, a more updated definition below, which I think it, um, is more helpful because it's hard to uh, separate man from green space um, currently. So traditionally we talk about man versus nature, uh, that man is conquering nature. And the implication is that the earth has unlimited resources. And even there's a lot of emphasis on the, un, you know, nature is unsafe or even deadly. And of course, there are some deadly aspects of nature like shark attacks, but um, clearly the city has even more deadly aspects. I think more appropriate is man is in nature or man is nature, as we found, um, as we're learning more about, for example, our, um, microbiome in our uh, gastrointestinal system and how really we have a whole ecosystem living in our in within us. So we really are part of nature. And for millennia, 
humans have lived in nature and really our physiology has adapted to it. Uh, a big example would be our whole fight or flight phenomenon, our sympathetic nervous system that has been geared um, to allow us to escape danger. But what's happened in modern life is um, the dangers are often perceived or they're um, more modern life um, stresses that causes us to have chronic stress, chronic um, sympathetic nervous system overdrive, which changes our physiology, increases our cortisol, and is related to a lot of these uh, chronic diseases that are prevalent. Um, I mention this now because I'll, I'll be coming back to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the, sort of the antidote and the counter to this overdrive of stress. Uh, individual, community, and planetary health are really inseparable. And what we do to the planet, we do do to ourselves. So better health cannot be achieved and sustained without the recognition that human health ultimately depends on the integrity of natural systems. This is kind of my common theme. So throughout history, ancient societies believed in the interconnectedness and interdependence with nature for health, healing, survival, and spiritual affiliation. And we see this today with the indigenous groups worldwide, uh, with a common belief that health and well-being of individuals is inseparable from nature and inseparable from the health of the community, that nature is really an extension of their body, mind, spirit, lifestyle, and values. And they believe in using the land, only using what they need and not destroying it. Hippocrates did uh, emphasize uh, the environment um, and the seasons when he wrote the treatise on airs, waters, and places, which was for physicians. Uh, so he took into account the environment. And then in 1984, E.O. Wilson wrote Biophilia. He talked about humans having a genetic predisposition to be attracted to certain features in nature that were once associated with our survival water, forest, vast open spaces. And since humans have evolved with nature, we're wired with an innate affinity for a meaningful contact with nature or an emotional affiliation with human beings to other organisms. I'll come back to this um, view uh, in a bit. And last though, we have sort of the modern view that nature is a commodity, it's more transactional. And actually, I think many people feel nature is a luxury, not a necessity, and we're forgetting our interdependence with nature. In 1949, Aldo Leopold wrote, we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. So uh, how do you evaluate nature interactions? You can look at the type of engagement. Are you actively walking or passively sitting? Or is it a virtual exposure, such as looking at this picture or perhaps listening to birds on tape? Then you have the spatial scale. Um, you know, how, uh, such as like a small would be a potted plant or a window view, medium scale would be gardening or walking in a park, and a large scale would be um, multi-day wilderness camping. And you take into account proximity, frequency of contact, your level of awareness within nature, and the sensory pathways used. I liked, uh, Tim Beatley uh, did a nature pyramid similar to the food pyramid, emphasizing that um, when you say you need to be exposed to nature, that doesn't mean you have to plan a trip to Yellowstone. You just have to step outside, look for uh, birds, look at the trees, the plants, and maybe weekly try to immerse yourself a little bit more, monthly maybe go to a park, a, a state park, and that sort of thing. There is a ton of research on the benefits of nature over 40 years. And when I uh, put into PubMed nature, I get 1.7 million hits and over 6,000 on nature and health in some way. And that includes uh, multiple randomized controlled trials. 
So here I'll emphasize some summaries and some uh, more recent or interesting research. And I have tried to reference everything, but please feel free to reach out if there's one that you don't find the reference for. Um, forest bathing has been particularly researched and there's 167 uh, research articles on that. So here's uh, from Park RX. It's a wonderful website that gives a lot of wonder, uh, great visuals for patients and others uh, showing some of the research evidence uh, in a pleasant way. And they also have um, other resources on their website. What are some of the specific benefits? Physically uh, improved child development, both cognitive and motor, improved creativity, general health, immune function, memory and attention, pain control. In addition, increased physical activity, improved post-operative recovery, sleep, and reduced mortality. Um, children clearly um, need exploratory play, which is uh, particularly conducive in nature for uh, helping promote brain development. I wanted to talk about this immune function for a little bit. Uh, King Lee did a study where um, people were in the woods for a couple hours for three days in a row, and he tested their natural killer cells, which uh, help the immune system fight tumors and infections. And he found a 40% increase in these NK cells. Uh, he hypothesized that it was due to the aromatic volatile substances or phytonicides that the pines and other trees emit. So he followed with uh, another study where he put individuals in rooms and some had the Hinoki cypress tree stem oil infused in there, others did not. And those with the infused oils had a 20% increase in their NK cells. Regarding memory, even short exposures to nature, including like a 40 second micro break of uh, stopping your screen time and looking outside uh, can boost your attention. Um, it's also been shown to um, help decrease uh, aggression and um, also uh, improve uh, testing on um, uh, like a math test. So here's um, one of the uh, first studies of nature back in 1984 by Ulrich. He noticed that people would drive, go out of their way to drive down tree-lined streets. So he created a study looking at records of patients who had their gallbladders removed. And he compared 23 patients in a room with a window view of a natural setting to 23 matched patients in rooms facing a brick wall. And he found that those with the natural scene had shorter post-operative hospital stays, took fewer analgesics and had fewer negative evaluative comments in the nurse's notes. This study has been replicated using um, thyroidectomy patients who had plants or flowers in the room, and also other surgical patients who just had pictures of nature as opposed to abstract art. Next, reducing illness. Nature's been associated with lower rates of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, myopia, asthma, and also lowers blood pressure and improves birth outcomes. I wanted to mention briefly about the myopia. There is a study um, that shows outdoor time will help diminish myopia progression from six to 24 months. Um, this was a prospective study done because initially we thought myopia is related more to screen time and reading more but it also is also lack of being outdoors. They've shown that the natural light offers a richer collection of light wavelengths and then the outdoor lets you look at different depths more often. Mental health benefits include reduced depression, stress, 
uh, as measured by decreased cortisol, reduced anxiety, aggression, improved ADHD symptoms, increased focus, increased sense of well being, pro social behavior, social connectedness, regard for the environment and in general, greater happiness and life satisfaction. So there's um, specific studies. Initially, a lot of the studies were more um, surveys, but now um, more studies are using um, blood levels and functional MRI. And one functional MRI study showed that after a 90 minute nature walk, there was decreased area in the area of the prefrontal cortex associated with depression and rumination. Here's um, one particular study by um, David Victorson. He took um, a number of young adults and caregivers affected by cancer into um, uh, the wilderness for a trek. And um, what he found was pre to post trek, there were significant self-reported improvements in feeling connected to nature, to the peers and to oneself, and also significant improvements in anxiety, depression, and sleep disturbance, along with significant decrease in IL-6, which is a pro-inflammatory biomarker. So, how does nature improve our health? Increased physical activity is one. Increased physical activity has already been associated with multiple health benefits. But uh, research does show that physical activity in nature has even more benefits than physical activity alone. In addition, there's increased social engagement opportunities. I, for one, see my neighbors so much more often in the summer than in the winter. Um, for children, there's more opportunities for discovery, creativity, risk-taking, mastery and control. And there are passive benefits uh, living near green space with reduced air pollution, noise, and heat. We are learning more and more the benefit of the sense of awe. When we experience awe from viewing nature, and this is just seeing something that um, it's hard to understand because it's so amazing. Uh, awe helps us reduce stress, become more generous, and feel a sense of plentitude. And actually, awe is evolutionary adaptive because we connect with others when confronted with vast sources, vast forces we don't really understand. And studies have shown that awe will lower the ILX. IL-6 inflammatory marker and increased parasympathetic nervous system also. There are two theories as to how nature reduces psychological stress. The Kaplans have the attention restoration theory where mental fatigue and concentration can be improved by time spent in or looking at nature. Then there is the stress reduction theory that I alluded to with biophilia, that spending time in nature might influence feelings or emotions by activating the parasympathetic nervous system to reduce stress and autonomic arousal because pe people's innate connection to the natural world. More recent research is trying to connect both theories using the parasympathetic nervous system. Here's a, a visual of um, by Hartick showing nature on the left and its benefits with health and well being on the right, uh, with emphasizing the four areas of air quality, physical activity, social contacts, and stress. I want to talk about some of the specific areas of nature and their benefits. Uh, as you know, there's a massive campaign to plant trees worldwide. And so um, I included trees here to explain some of their many benefits. I do uh, say native trees, um, and I'll talk about native later why um, that's so important. But trees in general 
filter a ton of air and water pollutants. In fact, they filter about 95% of stormwater pollutants. And uh, in one year, 2014, they removed 17 million tons of air pollution. They also control stormwater by absorbing water and also by keeping water in the leaves so it becomes like a second rain. They reduce urban heat island effects, provide shade and conserve energy, reduce noise and provide habitats for um, the local animals. And they also provide places for humans to recreate and exercise. There's a, an old study, 1999 in Modesto, California, that showed um, how for every dollar invested in trees, the residents had $1.89 in benefits, removing air pollutants, increasing property values, and providing shade, which saved over a million dollars in energy costs. Um, and last is about um, a study in Chicago where the residents of uh, inner city neighborhoods, some lived near a higher tree and grass uh, density area versus looking at concrete. And they compared the two groups in several studies and found increased preference for the trees and grass, increased social contact and a sense of safety and actually a decrease in crime in that area. The last study I wanted to mention is out of India that showed that more intact tree cover in the upstream watershed reduced rural children's probability of diarrhea. Here's one specific study um, looking at the effects of uh, tree loss on human health, providing a stronger evidence of causality between the two. This study studied the relationship uh, between human health and the spread of emerald ash borer, which uh, had caused the loss of 100 million ash trees. And they did the study to see if there would be any influence on cardiovascular and lung disease mortality. They looked uh, over 17 years in 15 United States and they found that there were more deaths in the counties infested with emerald ash borer, over 6,000 related to the lower respiratory system and over 15,000 cardiovascular related. They found that the magnitude of this effect was greater as infestation progressed and in counties with above average median household income. I wanted to mention forest bathing because um, it's, it's sort of like the mindfulness meditation of meditation. There's a ton of research on it. And um, one of the big researchers uh, is here, Quing Li. Uh, this is an article from him really talking about a new area of medicine called forest medicine. And Forest bathing began in Japan, Shinrin-yoku uh, is what it's called, and so the literal translation is forest bathing. And it's the idea of cultivating all your senses and opening them up to the woods. And this was a way in a very urban Japan to uh, combine nature and civilization. There have been a ton of research about forest bathing, and here are many of the benefits which are similar to what I've already talked about as far as nature benefits go. I also want to touch on biodiversity for human health. The humans depend on biodiversity in ways that are not always apparent or appreciated. So I, I put this polling carpet here for um, as a, a, a good analogy to what happens in an ecosystem when you remove some of the species and decrease the biodiversity. For example, if you remove predators, it'll cause a rise in herbivores and then a decline in the plant biomass. Every species in an ecosystem is important and plays a role. And if you remove some, you, it, it may appear that the ecosystem is still intact, but it has holes and it will not function as well. 
as if it was completely intact. Hence my carpet analogy. Um, and we see that now with our concern of the loss of pollinators, the loss of fish um, uh, in the oceans, and um, even in our gut microbiome where biodiversity is important. So human health depends upon the ecosystem for fresh air, water, food, and fuel. And although biodiversity loss can have significant human health impacts, some of them are more subtle. Ecosystem changes will can affect our likelihood, income, and local migration. We see that with some islands that are now not habitable due to uh, oceans rising. And over the course of recent history, um, there have been significant medical, scientific, and pharmacologic discoveries uh, based on Earth's biodiversity. And so there is extensive benefits in the fields of scientists and sciences uh, based on biodiversity. But above and beyond that, humans have emotional bonds and attachments to biodiverse environments. I like how um, kind of in the popular press, they'll say, well, are you a mountain person or a beach person? And some people, one area or the other resonates with them and gives them that awe that I talked about already that contributes to your well-being. Biodiversity related public health threats may only be solved by integrating health and environmental perspectives. So healthcare workers should really um, consider biodiversity based nature prescribing when they prescribe nature, um, such as nature conservation activities. And greater contact with an appreciation of biodiversity may foster environmental stewardship to support further biodiversity con conservation. Here is um, another great specific study done looking at biodiversity. This was in Colorado. They took uh, 10 hidden speakers, each playing a different bird song as shown there along two popular trails. And half the time they had the speakers on, half the time they had them off. They ended up interviewing over 500 hikers and they found that the hikers exposed to the phantom chorus had higher levels of restorative effects. These were either both direct or indirectly linked to them perceiving the uh, avian biodiversity. So how do I prescribe nature? Um, I Usually when I'm considering prescribing something, I consider the echo mnemonic. So E is efficacy and evidence. I think uh, there's lots of evidence to support nature exposure. C is cost. Now, nature exposure should be free, but in addition, how close is it? What's the proximity? Um, how challenging is the access to nature? Next, I have to consider, is there harm? And of course, we've talked about um, there are some dangers in nature. Um, I wouldn't tell people to go outside when you know we had air alerts going on due to the fires in uh, Canada, for example. Um, you have to be safe and you have to feel safe in order to get benefits from being in nature. And last is opinion, oh, opinion. And um, does the therapy match the person's opinions, beliefs, and culture? So everyone's different as to what um, aspects of nature are relaxing to them. I show a, a rough day on Lake Michigan here. Some people may find this picture relaxing. Some people may not. And so you do need to, when I'm prescribing, I need to take that into account. And in fact, in um, my literature review, I found anywhere between seven and 20% of subjects really didn't respond positively to nature exposure. So there will be a subset that uh, may not respond to nature. Um, I once had a babysitter when I moved from the city to the suburbs, she came up a few times and she was a city girl. 
And um, she said she couldn't come anymore because she felt afraid in the suburbs. It was too dark and too quiet for her. Um, so she was an example uh, that maybe she wasn't going to feel uh, relaxed in nature. What I would show patients is websites like ParkRx. It's a wonderful site giving nice visuals, as I showed you earlier, of some of the evidence base and how to enjoy nature. It also has prescriptions. Um, in the upper left, I wrote um, two hours a week, walking, sitting in a park if it's safe, or watching nature out your window or virtually, but trying to get two hours a week. And that's because of a study done in 2019 in England um, that showed uh, 120 minutes a week uh, had significant benefit. The upper graph is um, for good and very good health. And you can see at 120 minutes, it becomes significantly elevated. And the bottom graph is high well being, same thing at 120 minutes. I mentioned the nature pyramid and I like this handmade version as a way of showing patients that uh, what you can do if you want to experience nature on a daily basis and what the effects are. So on the left, there's some suggestions such as fresh air house plants. On the right, it, it tells you that it finds focus, de-stresses, decreases mental fatigue. So I like these for good visuals. And here's one for parents with children, uh, emphasizing getting children outside, getting their hands dirty, as we do know the benefit of the soil microbiome, or we're just starting to learn about a healthy soil microbiome and its positive effects. So how to reconnect? Um, you wanna take a short work breaks uh, when you're at the screens just to look outside. And even 40 seconds has benefits of just spending a few moments looking outside, taking a break. It uh, has been shown to increase worker productivity, lessen job stress, less aggression and higher scores on testing. In addition, um, turning off devices, you could consider an electronic free day, for example. When you go outside, it's important to focus on the surroundings to get the most benefit and really uh, viewing the horizon and the sky. And when you gaze upward and outward, it helps reduce self-rumination and allows you to be more present and feel more part of the greater world. And in fact, studies have shown that you become less selfish, self, selfish and really have a bigger feeling part of the whole. Next, there are many different ways of experiencing nature, which I've listed. And different people are going to have different activities resonate with them, just like different exercises and different foods. Everyone's different, so you have to find uh, the right activity for the right person. But for everyone, you need to seek the environment that relaxes you, even if it is virtual, and breathe deep. So uh, force bathing does emphasize engaging all five senses. Nature is one of the few places that we do this. And by using all five senses together, it is a shortcut to emotional restoration, uh, which can occur even after 15 minutes of really trying to focus on using all your senses in nature. Man is obviously very visual. Uh, this is a picture of a goldenrod with a bee on it. Um, when you're um, listening for sounds, you know, common sounds, the wind, water, the wings of this bee um, are. Uh, common things we can uh, listen for in nature. It is hard though, there is so much sound pollution out there that actually uh, contributes to deaths due to high levels of background noise. But if you focus, you may be able to hear some of the birds sing and that sort of thing, no matter where you are. Um, 
Humans have a wonderful sense of smell, not as good as dogs, but we can detect a trillion different smells. And some of them are on the subconscious level. In addition, um, touch is important. Going barefoot if you can, or just feeling the sun, wind, or cold on your face and taste. So I wanted to talk about access to nature. 100 million Americans do not have access to parks and that includes 28 million children. And about a third of Americans do not have a park or a green space within a 10 minute walk. 92% of low income urban blocks in the United States have less tree cover and are hotter than comparable neighborhoods. Uh, with higher income. And in fact, in parts of Northeast United States, low income urban blocks will have 30% less tree cover and are four degrees centigrade hotter, which is particularly relevant in this record breaking summer heat. There's also the concern of safety of green spaces. Um, Chicago, for example, has a lot of green spaces, but many of them are not safe for people to go to. And um, people can be fearful of nature or had no prior exposure, so they're not even sure how to get out in nature. And finally, health, health equities are greater in groups with limited nature access. And we see this, for example, parks that are serving a majority of people of color are on average half as large and serve nearly five times more people as parks that serve a majority white population. I have a couple busy visuals, but um, if you look back, you can see there's more blue on the left, red on the right. So the blue indicates the high income and the red is the low income. And as you go from left to right, it's, um, how much nature deprivation there is. So um, the lower income communities have more nature deprivation across almost all states listed. There is um, California, it's, they're very close, um, but almost all other states, uh, you have a separation of this nature deprivation. Similarly, this works for race. Across the United States, people of color are far more likely than white people to live in a place that is nature deprived. And you have the same X and Y axis here that um, the percentage of nature deprivation um, is shown much higher for on the right side, which is the blue, the people of color, as opposed to the left, which is green, the white. Um, one of the exceptions here is the District of Columbia, um, but almost all other states, you see the separation. And it's true with children too, that there are, when you compare families without children, only 36% um, have uh, nature deprived areas as opposed to families with children is 65% which gets all the way to 75% in non-white families with children. So why is there this nature gap, this uh, lack of nature exposure? And um, the Center for American Progress wrote this article with some of uh, their explanations that nature deprivation is a result of a long history of systemic racism. Discrimination affected human settlement patterns and protection of natural areas. Preferred lands were taken from Native Americans throughout our history. There is a long-standing systemic segregation and exclusion of people of color from natural public lands. People of color are the subject of violence and threats while in nature. We saw that with the bird watcher last summer in Central Park. And people of color have traditionally been excluded from the US conservation movement. And really clean drinking water, clean air, public parks and beaches, biodiversity and open spaces are shared goods to which every person in the United States has an equal right, 
both in principle and in law. But, you know, it's not happening. People of color and lower income um, communities tend to be near industry and pollution also. And nature is supposed to be a great equalizer, being free, universal, and accessible to all humans without discrimination. Um, here's an example, though, that gives me some hope. So this was a study looking at income groups, and the highest income group is represented by the black bars and the lowest by the lightest color bars. And on the y-axis is mortality. And what we find is that when you have lowest green space exposure, which is the far left, everyone has higher mortality. Um, and as you move to the right, that mortality decreases for all groups, but especially for the lowest income group. So this disparity is narrowed with green space exposure. So what are some of the solutions? Yeah, well, increasing green space, right? And especially native urban trees. Um, the Trust for Public Lands is mapping uh, United States parks to identify places in need. Then the 10 minute walk campaign works with them and with local mayors to try to get more green spaces. And one method they're doing is transforming and greening uh, the US schoolyards. There's over 90,000 US public schools that if they green them and make them open on the weekends and off hours, then another 20 million people will have a green space within a 10 minute walk. In addition, we have to think of our children, more outdoor schools and education. There's studies to support the benefits of getting outside, especially in these growing years. We need to make urban green space safer and more welcoming. Um, for example, uh, areas of high income, there's 90% 90, 90 of them have sidewalks, whereas areas of low income, it's only about 45%. We need more sidewalks and more ways for safe pedestrian and bicycle travel and involve the community in the planning. Um, there is an, an example in Texas where they found that although 20% of the population is over 65, uh, that group only visited the parks. They were only 4% of those who used the parks. But when they added a loop, twice as many of that age group used the parks. In a different angle, Homegrown National Park is trying to get everyone to plant native in the backyard to bring back the native insects that will bring back the native birds and other animals. And last, uh, bringing nature indoors is helpful for those who are unable to get to green space. And the estimate is that every dollar spent on creating and maintaining park trails can save almost $3 and healthcare alone. So here's an example in Philadelphia where they cleaned up the corner and they reduced overall neighborhood crime by 13% and reduced feelings of depression by 41%. So my last area is planetary health and public health. Um, I'm gonna go through this a little quick, but avoidable environmental factors cause at least 13 million deaths per year. That's about a quarter of the global burden of disease. And really we cannot be healthy on an unhealthy planet. And the public health impact from this planetary unhealth is being shown daily um, with these uh, Canadian fires affecting the air quality throughout the United States for multiple days this summer. Um, is just an example. But um, what I think we forget is we have a baseline level of air pollution due to burning of fossil fuels and agricultural emissions that these Canadian forests just added to. 
And uh, here's just another visual looking at human activities, its effects on the environment, and then the consequences to our own human health. I thought I'd talk about air pollution specifically because this is the largest environmental cause of disease and death in the world, um, killing, uh, causing about up to 10 million premature deaths annually. And in fact, 92% of the global population breeds unsafe air pollution levels. Now, air pollution emissions can be reduced and they've been reduced up to 70% for some pollutants in the United States and other industrialized nations by deliberate policy actions. But these actions were related to human health, not planetary health, but nonetheless, it benefits both. So the World Health Organization um, is uh, cognizant of air pollution and um, how deadly it is and is uh, promoting prevention. And there are many um, ill health effects, obviously, from air pollution. Uh, one thing is even like living closer to roads, you have a higher risk of autism, stroke, and cognitive decline in aging. I wanted to mention healthcare specifically. Um, we think we're the good guys, but the US healthcare emits about 10% of the total United States greenhouse gases. And a big part of this is because 97% of global health resources are spent on treatment. Only 3% is spent on prevention. So our focus on disease treatment and not more comprehensive health has inadvertently created the self-magnifying disease treatment sector with deleterious climate and ecological health impacts. This is one of the reasons I went into integrative medicine. So where are we? Over 50% of climate pollution is from the wealthiest 1 billion, which includes the United States. And the poorest 3 billion only contribute 5% and they suffer the worst consequences of climate change. We are at an unprecedented rate of extinction and possibly half of all species may vanish from nature by the end of this century. And it is truly felt that nothing we're doing to damage the functioning of the living world is more deadly than the biological extinction that is going on. So how do we change mindset? You know, humans still do not truly understand the intricacy and interdependence and actually the intelligence of nature. We're learning about the complexity of life and its dependence on the environment which leads us to better appreciate the need to safeguard the high diversity of both living organisms and their environments, but we're not there yet. Because the health impact, impacts of climate change can be generalized, however, to all of us, this may help influence public opinion about protecting the planet because saving earth will save ourselves. So as a healthcare professional, I think we have a big role, and I, I will add in there um, the academic and research arena, scientists, because the public views health issues as important, and there is high quality research out there. And I think the public trust of healthcare providers and scientists um, is pretty high compared to other areas, such as politicians. And so by um, addressing some of these environmental risk, uh, health risks and the influence of planetary health on human health, I think uh, we can get the public uh, uh, to um, understand and um, also help with trying to decrease planetary um, damage and therefore improve human health. So um, I'm gonna end with a couple what to do's. I'm not gonna um, go through them uh, in detail, but biodiversity is so important. This is a uh, community native garden uh, in my uh, hometown. It's only a year old. I think it's beautiful. 
And it's a way of showing the community that native plantings and gardens can be beautiful and intentional. And really with biodiversity, if you plant native, if you avoid removing your leaves in the fall, which is where the insects winter, and turn out your lights at night so that the moths and um, the fireflies can do their thing, uh, that would be huge benefits for biodiversity. We can do things on a local level. Talking about native plants, um, why it's so advantageous to plant native, they're already adapted, they're not invasive. They are sources of food for native critters. Uh, they're more resistant to environmental changes. They have reduced maintenance and they really do protect at-risk species and biodiversity. Specifically, I wanted to talk about um, old growth forests and why they are so important. There's a wonderful new book out by Peter Wollobin called The Power of Trees. And he talks about how um, trees work cooperatively through the root system and the fungal network. They warn each other of danger. They learn from drought and that sort of thing. They actually have memories via their roots and they share food in times of need. Um, and uh, really we just, are beginning to understand the complex network under our soil. Um, and obviously native um, old growth forests have biodiversity, they've adapted, and we know they're very beneficial to prevent droughts. They really suck moisture thousands of miles from the ocean front into the interiors of continents, allowing rain to fall deep into the interior. And when you cut down these forests, this benefit decreases by 90%, hence we get droughts. Um, we also know that forests cool. So an example is 27 degrees cooler compared with the city and 15 degrees cooler compared with a commercial pine plantation, which does not have biodiversity um, in it. So, just planting you know, pine trees won't be the answer. We need this biodiversity. What to do sustainability, I won't read all of these, but if you live in a simpler way so that others will simply survive, and here I'm emphasizing growing vegetables or, or um, that sort of thing. And Finally, I think there's a lot of emphasis on chemical exposure. You're all familiar with the forever chemicals, the PFAS's, and they're literally in all of our bodies and in nearly all our water now. Um, uh, this is, you know, things like Teflon and stain resistant and fire retardant chemicals. Um, there's more and more in the news about them. And I do think this has contributed to a lot of the chronic illnesses that have become epidemic. And so hopefully in time, we will be able to reduce our exposure to some of them. And here's a list of things you can reduce personally. For example, eating organically grown or at least from the dirty dozen uh, by the Environmental Working Group uh, can give you benefit. I wanted to mention air purifiers here. There was a study in Shanghai done with healthy college students and um, it was a randomized control study where they put half of them in rooms for nine days with indoor air filter purifiers and the other half in sham purifiers. And they found that those who spent the nine days with the air filter purifiers had a 50% reduction in pro-inflammatory markers. And uh, he did study glucocorticoids, catecholamines, free fatty acids, and insulin resistance in this study, and all of them were decreased. So um, in summary, there's multiple evidence-based benefits to nature exposure. Two hours a week, uh, if not more, uh, really gives you a great benefit. Human the health sector has the expertise and trust to inform the public 
of the health impacts of climate and environmental change and to help foster um, a connection to nature. And nature exposure can promote nature preservation. I do have a few more slides, um, just uh, if you get a copy, uh, listing a lot of organizations out there. We have one locally called NCH2, um, which um, works at um, a triple aim of caring for local ecosystems, community health and equity and environmental justice. And I did feel hopeful looking at all the wonderful organizations out there trying to help with some of these issues. I have suggested reading and multiple references. And thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anne. You're welcome. I'm going to try to unshare my screen here real fast. There we go. So I think people will be interested in, in seeing some of those references and the recommendations that you had. Um, again, thank you for an excellent talk, very rich with information. And I was particularly pleased to see how much emphasis you are putting on biodiversity, because I think that is not often acknowledged enough of how important that is in terms of our own health and planetary health. And um, as far as I know, I think there's actually a um, conference of the parties coming up in December focused on biodiversity, and they're hoping on an international level this is going to be similar to what the um, the Paris Agreement was um was in 2015, I think it was COP25 at the time, they're hoping it's gonna match that kind of um, success in terms of putting biodiversity on the map really for at an international level. So thank you for that. Um, we literally have two minutes left. Um, if anybody has any questions, please do raise your hand um, and Anne, I'm hoping we'll have some time to answer any questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if not, feel free to reach out to me because um, I know I kind of cram a lot of information into into the talks, uh, but that's intentional. So you can think about it later, too. Bob has a question. Bob Schwartz, um, please unmute or put your video on. Sorry, no, I was just, uh, I, that was a clapping. I, 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 mean, <laughs> I, I enjoyed the conference. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vertroy. Uh, that was great and uh, certainly stimulating, um, I think, for all of us. The, these are things that I've been thinking about uh, in, in terms of the obligation of healthcare providers to discuss these issues with their patients and encourage not just to take their medications, but uh, also uh, the, the whole issue of being uh, involved in the environment and uh, taking responsibility for not only their own health care, but their neighbors and their community. Yes, thank you. I do think that by using the human health angle, we're going to get more people on board uh, to address the planetary health issue. That's what I'm hoping, at least. And, you know, healthcare professionals have a, a great position to do that. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Anne. And uh, Lisa, I think, is um, she has some noise in the background. Otherwise, Lisa would normally come in to close uh, the session today. But if anybody on the call is interested in being a speaker on our Planetary Health Speaker Series um, in the future, then please do write to me and Lisa and, uh, and we can get that lined up. But um, thank you again, Anne, and um, look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you.